So I have the dubious honor of speaking to where the common good first fits into the bigger picture of the South African landscape, which means that I'm going to speak a little bit to some of the government policies and white papers that were released earlier this year. Unfortunately, you heard very well that I do not work for the government, so therefore, please do not hold anything against me, and I don't think there are any persons from government in the audience. I think that those that decided that, that were on the list decided not to come, for some dubious reason. Um, I'm told that they were called to Parliament this morning, and that's what's happening in Parliament. Anyway. So I need to look a little bit at digital social innovation, economic empowerment, and higher education landscape of South Africa, and then the role of common good first in the bigger picture of South Africa. So if we look at innovation and technology development in South Africa, I think we have quite a few members from the social innovation industry and partners like that. Um, at the moment for them, it is a situation of being a victim of a, a low voting business confidence. Everything is about wait and see, given the current economic climate. Um, we have a number of country, uh, companies that are moving offshore as well, out of South Africa and going offshore. In the non-profit sectors, however, and with the corporate social investment side of things, innovation is doing quite well. And um, we will hear about that in some of the sessions following here after today. Then, of course, we have our national government departments, and I'm not going to name all of them, but there are a number of um, national departments, the, the provincial departments, and the local governments that are now embarking on innovation initiatives and, in actual fact, the very latest policy of the Department of Science and Innovation, which has been renamed from Science and Technology to Science and Innovation. Lots of interesting roadmap for innovation in going forward. <coughs> However, as it is with policies and things like that, some of these are not necessarily grounded in the latest <coughs> innovation theories as we would want it to be. But I think we need to give them the benefit of the doubt that in time to come that will hopefully happen, and that some of the best practices that we will see in projects of this nature will actually impact on policy as well as we go forward. Of course, then, the other issue, as we well know, with many um, intergovernmental departments, that coordination is often a problem, that they will still remain in certain silos. In the higher education landscape and then in science and innovation, we now have the two departments that we integrated. So already we have done away with some of the lines there, but then we have the Department of Postal Services and Communications that are still separate to the and the lines are a little bit blurred there as to what their role is in this whole um, innovation landscape. So I think we, we're still likely to encounter some problems in the uptake of innovation within the government environment, but all is not lost, we hope. If we just look a little bit at the 2019 white paper on science, technology and innovation, I think this is really um, where we would like to position the Common Good First project in terms of science, technology, innovation, and then higher education. The Science and Technology Innovation White Paper was released in March this year, and currently the department is on a roadshow throughout the country where they've gone to all the different universities to speak about the White Paper. And um, some time ago we had the, the DG, Dr. Fumichwafa, at uh, Mandela University, and I have to just say that some of the notes that I'm using uh, courtesy of, of the DG, so uh, it's not my own notes. He analyzed the policy very eloquently, so I thought I would just rather use some of these notes. Um, I think what is very important is that there's a strong will in the Department of Science and Innovation to ensure that this particular notion of innovation receives attention at the highest levels at presidential and ministerial structures. We have special task teams that are dedicated to enhancing innovation. There's also 
a governmental effort to enable innovation via an innovation compact across government. Now exactly what do they need with the innovation compact, that remains to be seen. But in short, they are um, creating interministerial groupings that will be working together in terms of this. And then there's a strong notion, which is, is very heartening, that science and innovation wants to build a partnership with the private sector, and then of course with civil society. So it's no longer government, private sector, and then civil society, but the partnership of all those partners together. And then a strong aim to enhance the innovation footprint, not only at national level, but taking it right down to grassroots level, not even provincial level, but sub-districts, etc. Which I think speaks to the very essence of some of the issues that we'll be hearing later on from our social innovators, the challenges that they were trying to address. And I think this, this bodes well for the future in, in terms of where innovation is going in our country. We also want to implore to the Department of Science and Innovation because they are looking at using innovation to improve government service delivery and then also decision making. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, there's a, a whole move towards putting everything online, e-everything. Um, those of you who do know our e-government is not very advanced yet in South Africa, in particular spheres they are, I know here in the Western Cape, they have been very proactive for many years, but there are other parts of the country where it's just not happening at all. Um, and through the new innovation policy, there's also a vision to upscale all of that. The only government department that is extremely efficient, and too efficient, is the South African Revenue Services. <laughs> The E side is extremely well orchestrated. Anyway, um, I happen to have a master's student who's doing her research on, the, well, she works for an organization that builds the back end for the um, South African Revenue Services um, E system. And I've often wondered whether we shouldn't just find some ways to <laughs> penetrate and tweak a few of the algorithms there. <laughs> if you have any innovation, thoughts around that, let me know. <laughs> then also, I think one thing that is very important that in the Department of Science and Innovation, they have a specific directorate that speaks to grassroots innovation. And unfortunately, the chief director of that, um, Ms. Ronchard van Kieser, was meant to be here this morning, but uh, she could unfortunately not make it at the very last minute. Uh, but Montanfa's division drives a strong grassroots innovation program looking at different aspects of society. So they focus on agriculture, on um, financial technologies, on health, and education, etc. So um, I think that that's very really proactive. So when you look at the new white paper and, and so forth, there are a number of opportunities that, that come to the fore, and I have mentioned some of these. But I think what is important is the impact that this white paper will have on the economy but also on the environment when it is now implemented. And I think that is where us as academia come in and where we need to play a very strong role in assisting people to shape the roadmap of this implementation because we know that does not always happen the way it should. Then, of course, the whole transformation of the human capabilities of the National Science Innovation and the South African Roadmaps, where we now have higher education and science and innovation together. And then also, where we have formally dispersed government departments, there is a unique opportunity to bring them together through innovation. And I think what we're trying to see is that social innovation and innovation in science and technology and higher education will become the umbrella that will bring all these different government departments together. Of course, one can hope for that. So, if we, for a moment, stop on the role of government, let's see now my text is moved up. This is what happens when you change your slide at the very last minute. But anyway, um, 
I want you to, to think for a moment, and, and when I'm, I'm done, I'm going to ask for some comments um, from the audience as well, but what do you see the role of government to be in this innovation space, in the social innovation space? Um, should they be part of the upscaling of initiatives, such as Common Good First, to allow us to take it beyond the borders of South Africa, but to the rest of Africa? Um, should this influence policy directions in the future white papers that they are developing? And um, should they play a role in strategic innovations that we are going to bring to the table in terms of setting agendas, international operations, all of that? Do we think that is a place and a, and a role for government in this? But let's for a moment look at who this is for. Who do we think this science, technology, innovation, white paper, policies, all of that could be for? So first and foremost, I want to say for social innovators. To me, that is the very first beneficiaries of this. And these are the people that should reap the benefits of these new policy directions. We have technology transfer offices at the universities more and more so we are under pressure to have technology transfer happening and commercialize solutions and so forth. There are also corporates that launch new innovations that can benefit from this. Technology developers, universities, students, research institutes. So I think for me the beauty of Common Good First is that it provides a superb opportunity for national and international technology based companies for technology entrepreneurs, for investors, for finances, and other technology commercialization partners to access the latest and best innovation offerings from South African universities and the network of social innovations. To me, that is the ultimate essence of Common Good First, that it offers those benefits. So, to the people here in, in the room who are social innovators, why should you showcase your innovations on a platform such as Common Good First? If you showcase your innovations, you will get the chance to engage with business, with government, with academia, and obviously have access to a number of matchmaking and networking opportunities. And a little bit later today, Isabel and myself are going to plant a few seeds for you to ponder on in terms of networking opportunities. So with your participation, of course, you have the opportunity to positively influence the direction and the pace of innovation and, if appropriate, commercialization within the South African context. So for you to participate in Common Good First is far more than just putting your story out there. It is about actually influencing the entire direction of social innovation within the South African context. And of course, not to exclude our European partners, um, but specifically in our context now, we would look at it from that perspective. So what would typically be some of the benefits over and above the obvious ones, such as strengthening and expanding your network? You would also hopefully build some lasting relationships. And for us, as higher education institutions, I think we can build relationships with the future talents that come through the ranks of our student bodies. Um, you get to interact with government leaders, decision makers and agencies. Remember, the policies and, and service delivery policies that we have are only as good as what we have given feedback into that. If we do not participate in that process, then we're standing on the side and criticizing things that we could have changed. Also, you will be receiving attention from leading experts in the industry, in the media, professionals, students, the likes thereof. And meet new and potential partners in an environment where technology and industry and business is very openly discussed, as you will see in the course of today. Also promotes new businesses and partnerships, and you may come across some potential future investors you see a business opportunity in what you are putting there. And then, lastly, but certainly not least, <coughs> is to receive some press coverage. There's 
a lot to be said for publicity <coughs> and being known out there. So, a few concluding remarks from my side. I say there that it is clear that technological change will usher in challenges and uncertainty, but at the same time, it brings highly innovative and cost-effective solutions that will improve and enhance the digital lives of consumers and merchants across Africa. I think what is very, very important is the whole introduction of technology has changed the way we work, we think, we do things. Mm -hmm. Um, we were talking just now over tea, Carol and myself, um, about the uses of technology and how that has changed our work environment and, and we were talking about uh, being able, through the use of technology, to create the freedom of allowing people to work from home and work at any time, any place, that, that kind of situation. And how technology has improved productivity because of that. So I think it brings a huge advantage. And then, of course, there's the whole matter of the fintech, the agri-tech, the edu-tech, the health-tech. The revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that everybody speaks about all the time. Um, in many ways, we may actually surpass the fourth and just go straight to the fifth. Yeah. I personally believe that. Um, I think we skipped a few generations and we will probably lead from here again. And then, of course, to have access to innovative, secure, and accessible solutions that is becoming more and more available in the marketplace. And I, I just want for a moment to pause on accessibility. So accessibility, not only in the sense of having access to technology in this sense, but also providing access in alternate ways for other abled people to interact with technology. So finally, the demand for interconnected multi-purpose solutions will increase in the future, and it will open the door to more and even um, more advanced inventions and collaborations by, for example, mobile phone providers and a variety of other services companies. But probably most importantly, harnessing modern technologies will improve how companies interact with their customers. And stable, fast, and secure networks will be the key enablers of the digital highways of the future. So as much as we think that we are now coming to a place where we are just comfortable, we need to move into the next gear and make sure that we have access to all the high technology that is out there. And that's why I say I think we're going to leap from industry 4.0 and go straight into 5.0. And with that, I thank you. Maybe if there are some, I think we've got how many minutes? Two, three minutes? Yeah. Two minutes? Okay, questions or comments maybe from the audience? In particular? Yes, um, I found it interesting that there was this question around the role of government in change making. And I, I, I was speaking to that a little bit in the relationship between on the ground behaviours and their incentives to change when structurally that was disincentivised or penalised actually to to make positive reforms in their in their choices and their behaviours and so having that kind of systems approach to to kind of social change is so important where structures can facilitate positive behaviour change. Thank you. Thank you very important. Anybody 